is I have a question. Um, does anyone out there not know what Labor Day is, but you're a, a little too afraid to ask because you're 28 years old and you feel like at this point in life you should know what Labor Day is and why it's celebrated? Um, if so, you're alone. Um, I actually, I've known since I was four. Um, I've got a scholarly, I've got an article here that I, this quote has been on my heart for years, years, years. But I figure there might be some of us in here that not know what Labor Day is. Um, so I was going to go ahead and read it. I can't remember if this is what I gave you or not. But this is from the U.S. Department of Labor. Everybody else like studied that when you were a child, right? That's why I know this. Um, this is from their History of Labor Day. So the, I, I trust this website is legit. The first Labor Day happened on September 5th. That's fun. 1882. It's a long time. It's a long time. Not as long as Christmas, but it's a long time. Um, and we have that the, I don't know if that's true. I don't know when we began. Uh, all right, so here's our quote. This is what they say about Labor Day. American labor has raised the nation's standard of living and contributed to the greatest production the world has ever known. Hmm, pause. Pyramids? I'm not so sure that's the greatest. Anyway, greatest that the world has ever known. In the 1800s, we really think it was more impressive. And going back to it, and the labor movement has brought us closer to the realization of our traditional ideas of economic and political democracy. It is appropriate, therefore, that the nation pays tribute on Labor Day to the Creator, of so much of the nation's strength, freedom, and leadership, the American worker. So, Labor Day, if you did not know, you guys, was a holiday that was created recognizing, wow, the U.S. are the best producers of humans to have ever walked on the face of the earth. We should celebrate them. So let's give them a day off of work. Um, Anybody else feel like that's kind of like when you were in like kindergarten and you and your family bought 500 boxes of cereal just so you could collect box tops and get like a half a slice of pizza for a celebration because your class, it was like we, we spent a thousand dollars on cereal just so I could get a slice of pizza at school, right? Um, it is kind of funny like this thing. It's like, wow, if we really believe that they are the greatest laborers to have ever worked on the planet, it sounds to me like more than one day off a year would be a little bit more fitting if this is the truth of why uh, from the Department of Labor uh, this holiday has existed. So I think that's kind of funny. It feels like that to me. Um, so once again, if you are unlike me and you don't know the history of the United States with perfection, the uh, Labor Day, it's a national holiday where labors are celebrated beginning of the day off for being, quote, the most productive laborers in the world and to pay tribute to Another quote, the creator of so much of the nation's strength, freedom, and leadership, the American worker. So when I knew I was going to be preaching this week, uh, we knew that there was going to be a little bit of a break to happen naturally, right? We're going to go through the hook, the hook, the book of Habakkuk uh, here in a few weeks. We were like, well, we don't want to start it and then have an evening service, and then have the other. It didn't feel right, so like, we knew we would do a few. Um, so I've got this week. Jared's got next week. He's not here, but I'm not going to talk negative about him behind his back. I love Jared, and I'm so excited to hear the word from him. Uh, so this week, uh, Corey was like, hey, what if you do Colossians 3 and working unto the Lord? That's the sermon. You've already heard it. If you want to leave and go get lunch, I guess you can. That's the spoiler alert. That's what we're talking about. Um, but he was, it, it was on the schedule to do that. And I was like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, but honestly, I feel like since I knew nothing about what Labor Day was, and I, I don't. And I figured some of y'all, well, if, if it's Labor Day and we're going to talk about working under the Lord, that sounds really like kind of clicky and topical and like, oh, wow, you have that church, the pastor's going, they're bringing the student guy up to talk about labor on Labor Day, of course. The pastor's not even out of town. Usually that's what it is. It's like, it's a holiday, so we'll get the student guy up there and we'll talk about a, a cheesy topic. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but I figured it was best that we knew a little bit about what Labor Day was and why it was invented to celebrate the creator, not of Earth, but the creator of America's freedom, not God, the creator of America's success, not the Lord. Anyway, so that's why... Uh, that's why Labor Day exists. But I also feel like we should know a little bit about the book that we are going to be studying 
before we talk about such a small section of it. I'd be giving a huge disservice to the word of the Lord to be like, all right, here's two verses out of a book and here's what it means for your life. I think that's really awful because that's how you can teach some really horrible things. So now that we have done a little bit of Labor Day talk, I wanna talk some about the book of Colossians. That's where we're gonna be. If you wanna flip there, you can make their way. We're specifically gonna talk about chapter three, verses 24, 23 and 24. But before we do that, I wanna look at the entirety of the book a little bit. Are y'all cool with that? Okay, should we read the whole thing start to finish? We won't do that. I think you should this week. That'd be cool. It's four chapters. Just go do it. Read the whole thing. It'll take you like 40 minutes at most if you read real slow and you study. So do it. You got 40 minutes. Read the whole book this week. Challenge. End of the sermon. Go. No. Okay. So generically speaking, Paul, who wrote to um, the church in Colossae, I always thought it was Colossae, but I did a lot of pronunciations online and they all said Colossae. Weird. Is it, if you heard Colossae, Colossae, I don't know. Of this church, he wrote, he wrote a letter to them. And he wrote letters to a lot of church, churches. That's what a lot of our New Testament is, or his letters. And he had a general outline that they all follow. What's the first thing you do when you write a letter to somebody? Greetings. Greetings. Hey, guys. How's it going? It's Paul. You don't say that. Uh, you probably say your name when you write a letter to somebody. But you, you say who you are. Um, the next thing he would do is he was a statement of thanksgiving which isn't the holiday. It didn't exist back then. He, would, he was praising the people for what they had done. Like, man, Thanksgiving, I want to live, like praise God for what you are doing in the world. He would always like compliment them, right? Following that, which is the bulk of the books usually, would be teachings of Christ slash corrections. So you're like, hey, like it's Paul again. Nice to see y'all. Y'all have been doing wonderful. Y'all, y'all familiar with compliment sandwiches? Y'all been doing wonderful. Like your love for one another is amazing. Uh, Jesus said, you should live this way. So maybe you, and he would, he would offer some correction. That was usually the bulk of most of them. Um, it wasn't always correction. And then he would end with some sort of uh, big point or summary. So then, and it would kind of wrap everything up in a nice little bow. Uh, but my favorite thing, uh, my favorite thing, honestly, is how he ends it. Does anybody know how he ends a lot of his letters? The students should. We talked about it. Come on, Coop, you've got this. Michaela, put him on the spot. You know, remember? It, what, what, is he, what does he want them to do to someone else in town? Maybe that helps. Good thing. No, I mean, he wants, he's, he, he, like a lot of his, y'all are doing great. I put y'all on the spot. There was no prep for that. Um, <laughs> he will be like, hey, say hi to so-and-so. And it's just such like a human way to end these. He'll be like, oh, hey, say hi to so-and-so because they're my friend. It's cool. I like it. I think it's re- it just really humanizes these books of the Bible to realize like, oh, this is a real guy who had friends in a town. And it's like, although he's like teaching us and the Lord is speaking so much for, through him for us to learn, he's also a human who has friends that he wants people to say hi to him for. That's really cool. Um, so that's the generic outline of, of most of Paul's letters. Um, our passage today is going to come from that like teaching or corrections body of the letter just so you know that like I said it's in chapter 3 so it's you know towards the end in the, in the middle um, but I want to walk us through what that teaching section looks like so starting in chapter 2 chapter 2 talks about how Christ is fully God and that through faith in him we are alive and no longer have a record of debt chapter 2 verses 6 through 7 say it this way. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And then he goes on for the second half of of that book, and he says, because of this, because your full record of debt has been set aside solely through faith in him, you don't need to be judged for any religious practices that you partake in. Because your religious practices don't bring you any salvation. They don't bring you any merit. It's only through Christ. So you can't be judged by the foods you eat or the way you live. And that's kind of way he, he transitions that through the second chapter. Going on to chapter three, he gives fashion advice. Kind of cool. It's not clothing fashion advice. It's spiritual fashion advice. But that's what he does. He looks at the people and he tells them to change their clothes. He informs them of how God wants them to be clothed in righteousness. First, uh, and oh yeah, I'm going to preface this. If you're a really churchy person, I don't think I'm going to have any scripture references or things to say that are going to be new today. I'm going to be honest with you. 
Um, but I do think the word of the Lord will be illuminated in you. If you're not a churchy person, then the things we're going to go through today are so powerful. And I, I, my genuine prayer is that you hear how much God loves us and what he desires for you. And the fact that it keeps on getting better and better and better. Back to the Bible. All right, so chapter 3 um, God uh, tells first what they need to take off before you get ready for school or for work or for whatever. Every day you first have to take your pajamas off to put on your clothes. So he tells them they need to take certain things off before they can be clothed in others. So verses 5 and then 8 through 9, he tells them what to take off. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, Moving over to eight. But now uh, you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have been put off, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. So Paul starts, he says, hey, you, your record of debt is gone through your faith in Christ. Now put off all those earthly things. Get rid of that. You don't need that way of life anymore. And it tells them to put on the heavenly attributes. Attributes. It's attributes when you're talking as a... And then attributes. That's like... Yeah. Attributes. <laughs> Couldn't think of any words there, but I said it right with attributes. Right? Is that general consensus? Thanks. Um, t- verses 12 through 17. <laughs> Sorry, right, Tommy. It's all right. I laughed at myself. I was. I told myself I could look. I. I practiced saying my sermon. I was like, I could look this up, or I can just ask everybody on Sunday. So that's what I went with. Um, so ch- verses twelve through seventeen of chapter three, God. Uh, Paul tells them, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And that's where we land on our section of the story today. Remember, he's writing to a town of people to try to help them grow closer to the Lord. And he says, hey, because you have faith, your record of debt is gone. You can't be judged for what foods you eat, how you act, because your, sanctif- or your salvation is through faith in Jesus. Because of that, put off all those earthly things. The things he died for, don't keep wearing them. Get rid of them and put on righteousness. And then we get to our section today, uh, which are verses in, in its totality, 3, 18 through 4, 1. Um, but before we read through that, I want us to know a few things about this section. If you have subtitles in your Bible, um, it's probably labeled something like rules for Christian households. Anybody else say something different? Anybody not have subheadings? Um, it's just helpful to help us understand what we're talking about. So Paul does all this description, description for the totality of the people, and then he says, hey, your households, this are what they should look like. This is what they should look like. So anybody know of some people that might be addressed in a household? If you're addressing a household, a generic household of people, you raise your hand. Oh, you're like, no, no, I, di- I didn't mean I want to answer. I just said I knew. Anybody want to say some? A husband and a wife, those are some people we'd address in a house. Anybody else? child. Anybody else? Sister, mom? Okay, yeah, so different names kind of for those. Okay, anything else? A dog? For some people, probably before a child would come with their dogs. Um, um, I'll never forget, this is a random tangent because you've said that. Um, By the time Liv was like eight months or so, we had uh, some friends from out of town who got a dog, and they looked at us, and they said, guys, we really understand what it was like to lose so much sleep. We can't sleep because of this puppy, and I wanted to smack them. Uh, But yes, for some people, it's like, dog for real, like, I love my Sophie. I love her so much. She is my, she's my favorite friend to go hunting with. It's not a human, it's my dog, so I I relate fully. I get it. I get it, people. Um, I noticed no one said that a part of their family household is a slave. 
right? So in this section for rules for a household, husbands, wives, children, it doesn't say brother and sister, but that's because they all kind of relate. Uh, husbands, wives, children, and bond servants. I'm actually curious, does anybody have theirs open? Go to chapter 3, verse mm, mm, 22. What word does it start with? Slaves, bond servant, anything different? Cool, we'll get to that in a second. That's great. I'm glad there was nothing different because then I would have felt like a fool here in a second. Um, so let me ask y'all, of those four, I, I'm going to ask for some raised hands. Which one you feel like you best identify with? If you best identify as husband, raise your hand. A few hands in the house. Uh, what about wife? An equally amount of few hands. What about uh, child? Okay, a few amount of hands. What about uh, bond servant or slave? No hands? Uh, what about neither? What if you listen to that whole list and you're like, I, I don't know if I relate to any of those. We've got some. We've got some hands. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to say to you first, know that that's not because you don't fit into some sort of family structure. It's because Paul is trying to teach a group of people. And remember, when he's teaching them the biblical teachings of Christ, then he's trying to correct them and help them live. So likely it was that Paul was getting word that households were not going very well in Colossae, Colossae, Colossae. The households weren't going very well. So he was like, hey, this is what your household needs to look like. So for those of you who said, I don't know if I really fit into any of those, that's fine. Paul wouldn't have dressed you and said, hey, you need to fix your household. Like that just means that he was good job. You weren't getting something wrong because you weren't within a household. Like, he's just trying to help those who are. So know that, like, oh, this sermon has nothing to do with me because we're talking about what a household dynamic is. No, the word of the Lord has something really special uh, for us. But I did notice no one raised their hand as a bond servant, right? Or a slave. Now, I was, I was actually talking with Charlie, and I was, I was talking through my struggle. This is my, sh I spent more time on this section of my sermon than the rest of it, um, honestly. Um, I was talking about this, and Charlie goes, can you say bondservant and not slave? Or something, you're like, I prefer bondservant. I, like, and which is fair. Because when we hear the word slave, I think there's one of, I'm gonna say two things that pop in our minds. One is early American history, where people took people from another land and forced them into slavery. Uh, two, I think, is right now, what's happening with uh, sex trafficking and labor slavery. This still happens to this day where people are taken against their will and forced to do whatever the master tells them, and that thing that the master tells them is awful and hateful and horrible for them. So I think when we hear this word slavery, it's like, mm, I don't like that being in the Bible, and I don't either. Because what our, if, if, if Paul was writing to the Church of America or the Church of Austin Life or whatever it be, I don't think he would address slavery. He wouldn't use this word because it's not in our vernacular. But it actually is in theirs. We'll see later on. I think it's in Romans 6. It is. Is that where I go? In Romans 6, uh, when he's talking about this, he even says, I'm using such common terminology with you so that you'll understand what I'm talking about. So when he's writing to this church, it wouldn't have been like when he said slave. Like, Wait, what? Are we allowed to? Can we, can we take control of people? Can we? No, like Paul, and whenever we go into Romans 6, he's like, hey, you understand what I mean when I talk about the relationship of a slave and a master. That's why I'm going to use this reference with you. So let's talk about what this word means. Um, the, pref the preface for your ESV Bible, if it may have a note, you click on it. I thought it was helpful. Uh, so I, I would like to just read this verbatim. I'm not copying, I'm, I'm not taking from them. What's it called? Plagiarizing. This is the preface, preface of the ESV Bible. And it says this. In the New Testament times, a doulos is often described as a bond servant. That is, someone in the Roman Empire officially bound under contract to serve his master for seven years. When the contract expired, the, free, the person was freed, given his wage that had been saved by the master, and officially declared a free man. The ESV usage thus seeks to express the most fitting nuance of uh, the meaning in each context, where absolute ownership by a master is spoken, such as in Romans 6, slave is used, where a more limited form of servitude is in view, bond servant is used, as in 1 Corinthians 7, 21 through 24, and we see here Colossians 3. 
where the context indicates a wide range of freedom, such as John 4, 51, the word servant is preferred. So if you read ESV or even in many other translations and you see where a word says servant or it says slave or it says bond servant, for the people who are receiving these letters and reading this text, it was all the same. They knew what all of that meant. It's the same word, and for them it was very straightforward. But it's really hard for us to go through a scripture when we talk about what our household looks like, and Paul's just like, oh yeah, and slaves live like this. Like, Wait, what? More so, if this is what the sermon's about, how are all of us who none of us identified as a bond servant or slave, how are we supposed to take this? Right, it's difficult. Another scholar explains this slavery or bond servant-ness. I made that a word. I don't care there's a red squiggly line under it. As this. It is hard in our day to understand someone who embraced slavery. But in a culture where landowners had economic security, indentured servitude would be the only way for many non-landowners to be secure. Thus, some would willingly bond, that's why we put that there, themselves to another person for this reason. In doing so, thou were, they were now required to perform the will of their master, but they put themselves into that situation. They were not forced into it against their will. Something that's even crazier that, that happened commonly. I'm going to share two, two facts about this. Um, first, I'll go down this. Where did I say it? I don't have it here. I'll skip it when it comes later on. Oh, right here. Uh, Factually speaking, from many sources, when this would have been written to them, as much as one-third of the Roman population were slaves, and as much as one-third had in their lifetime been freed of bondservantness, slavery, whichever word makes us feel most comfortable. So two-thirds of the entire Roman population, whenever I said, do you identify as a bondservant, would have been able to go, oh, I, I know exactly what that means. Like this room would have been filled with hands instead of whenever I said uh, son or daughter, and it was like, oh, most of the hands went up. When I said that, the room would have lit up. Oh yeah, we all know what that means. It had been very common, very understood for them uh, what it means. Um, the second thing is, even when people were use our term bond servants, and they were bound for seven years, it was relatively common, not majority, but relatively common for that person after their seven years to go, dude, I can't live on the streets. Can, can I serve you forever? And there was this thing, I don't know exactly, they would like nail it through their ear on the door or something to like prove like you are not, like you are my slave for life. I have marched you. Like, but the person was so like, this is way better. And almost... <sighs> For me, when I look at the totality of Scripture, I think immediately uh, Exodus. Like, God, it'd be so much, so much better to be slaves in Egypt than it would be to out here in the wilderness with nothing. That was coming from a point of misery, right? But this isn't coming from, well, I'd rather be a slave being treated horrible and whipped and being pushed to build the kingdom. Like, no, they're just like, I, I would love a dinner and a bed. Like, I don't care if you ask me to take care of the fields and like watch the kid, absolutely. Can I, can I please just be your servant for life? So that's kind of what this means. A little bit of the context. Um, I want to move on because I don't want to talk for 40 minutes about what a bond servant is. Um, but in that know that these people were, never, were not forced to do these things. Uh, the vast majority of the time, they sought out someone to be a slave to. And then even then, sometimes they continued on afterwards. And the majority of the people in the room would have raised their hand and be like, oh yeah, bond, that's me, I'm a slave. So, so know that as Paul is addressing these people. With that being said, now let us read this section, starting in verse 18, chapter three. Wives, submit to your husbands as, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but with the sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you have a master in heaven. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, we, um, I come to you thankful that humanity changes. Um, the fact that I can look at a text 
written thousands of years ago. And I'm not like, wow, we look exactly the same as we did. The fact that you made us in your image um, and, and that we are people who, during our lives and during our existence on earth, although kind of stray farther from you, we just come to look more like you. And I'm, I'm just grateful for that. Um, the Lord, you, you just make us so unique and individual. Um, I pray for our hearts as we read this text that was written to people so different than us. Um, I pray that we understand your love for them and your desire for them. And Jesus, I also pray that you, that we in this room understand your love for us and your desires for us and how this teaches us that, even though life was so different. Um, just be, just be with us today. Our hearts be open um, and that my heart be open and soften as well. Amen. Sweet. Okay. So it's critically important as we go through today that we remember Paul's teachings just before this, right? What two and three were talking about. Like you have been uh, justified uh, and you have been, let me scroll up, my brain just, um, Christ is fully God and through faith in him we are alive. We no longer have a record of debt because of this we cannot be judged on what we do because uh, faith through him is what takes rid of our debt, not what we do. Then in chapter 3, he tells them to put away all those things that Jesus died for. They're useless. You're, you're mocking what Jesus has done for you. Get rid of that. Put on his holiness. And then uh, here we get God instructing households. Um, and that's where we land today. So it's important that we remember all of that. So a bond servant, when he is told, he or she is told to do the things that they are told, it is um, that first, before they do that, they have been justified. The record of debt is gone and that they will put away, put to death all the things of the world and they will put on the righteousness of the Lord. And when all of that is done, then they will respond to how Paul is calling households to live here. So we are gonna focus just on this bond servant section today. Um, that's not because I'm like worried to talk about like, you know, wives submit to your husbands or husbands love your wife. Like I, I genuinely believe the word of the Lord is beautiful and he has a lot to teach us with this. I just don't have time. Y'all spent, y'all saw how long I took explaining what a bond servant was. I can't talk about what a wife submitting to your husband or husband's loving your wives be. We're gonna look just at the bond ser servant section today. All right, so once again, to make sure that we're all on the same page, what was a bond servant or slave again? Can someone, sorry stream people are watching on YouTube. Can someone explain a little, just a brief synopsis of what a bond servant or slave was? Maybe I'll give you prompts. How did they get in that scenario? They willing, they, ch they chose to do that. Why would you ever choose to be a slave? Why did they do that? Safety. They wanted to be able to know that they had food and a bed. So they would choose to, all right? All right, so these are people who chose to be put in a situation, not so that they could be abused, but so that they could have safety in their servitude towards their master. All right, so we understand that. Um, let's see, I don't, I, don't need to, I don't need to say any of that. Uh, it's important to know that these bond servants, there was no amount of work that would set them free. Like they, they were chose to, they weren't like, man, I know I'm bound for seven years, but I bet you if I work my tail off, I can earn effort and I'll be set free in five, right? And, and, and in America, I think we're, we're familiar to that. Like when we think of our, like the prison system, it's like based off of what's, what's good um, behavior. Yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> good behavior. It's like, oh, wow, this person, although we said they needed to go to prison for this long, like we understand that they've paid their debts. They're good. We'll, we'll let them out early. And, but this wouldn't have been a thing for them. It also wouldn't have been a thing that it's, uh, that, um, eh, no, that gets point. That it wasn't, it wasn't a m an amount of labor. It was like, okay, you need to work 500 denarii worth of labor. It's, they would be bond for seven years, maybe longer. So uh, there was no amount of labor that set them free. Uh, also, as a bond servant or slave, they could never gain any inheritance from their master. If something that's really cool here, I think is super fascinating. Uh, children and bond servants are actually told the exact same thing. Paul's like, hey, ha Christian households, uh, where is it? Boop -a -doop. Uh, children, obey your parents in everything. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. They have the same command, right? What's the difference between a bond servant and a child, though? What was that? Inheritance. When those parents die, are the bond servants getting anything? No. Are the kids? 
if there's something to give, yeah. Corey's like, uh, at the rate we're going, maybe not. <laughs> I feel you. Um, so, but yeah, but right. So the children didn't necessarily gain anything, or the children did gain inheritance. The bond servants, they did not gain any inheritance. They worked for safety, for security, for food. That was, that was their, exactly their purpose. Um, Ephesians 6 is another um, passage that goes on to explain a bit more in depth or it's slightly more, there's one more sentence. Um, it's pretty much this exact section when he's writing to the church in Ephesus, Ephesus, uh, I'm kidding, in Ephesus. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a funny guy sometimes. Um, oh man. I have here, um, I have here my wife's Bible. I couldn't find my Bible this morning after I did planning. Um, so I'm not as familiar with these pages. I'm gonna get there. They're really sticking together. Uh, Galatians, there it is. Okay. Uh, verse, in chapter six, verse eight, we get, or in chapter six, we get pretty much the same thing, rules for Christian households. Um, but in verse eight, I think it's something a little bit a- added that helps us uh, when talking about bond servants and obeying their earthly masters. Uh, it says this, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, uh, whether he is bond servant or he is free. So it adds on to this continuing thought, like work for the Lord, because that, when you work for the Lord, that's what you receive back from the Lord. Now, if you're getting worried based off of me saying that, hold your breath. We'll get there, I assure you. Uh, So this adds, and it adds to anyone, right? In verse eight, uh, it says, uh, knowing whatever good anyone does, uh, whether they are a bond servant or free. So Paul is like, man, this is, this news is for all of us. So if you don't uh, see yourself as a bond servant, now you're wrapped in. Paul said that this applies to us all. So, Let's go down. What does this mean for us? I have a question in the room. Is anyone here a people pleaser? If we can raise hands, just, just admit it. I'll, I'll raise my hand too. I'll help you out. Now, that's a negative term, right? When we think people pleaser, let me ask you this. Is anyone's love language words of affirmation? Probably a lot of the same hands. Yeah, that's, that's a little... Words of, I'm not saying that having a love language of words of affirmation is negative. No, none whatsoever. That's not what I'm getting into here. Um, but I do think, since it's, you know, Labor Day, I genuinely do think that the American dream, or whatever you want to call it, has twisted us, twisted us into the Western world of being in a place where we need affirmation as much as we need the air we breathe. In a place it's like, man, I, I just really want, like, I really want my spouse to realize that I cleaned the whole house today. I just want to say, hey, thank you. And it's like, when we do it, it's like, we need that. I think whenever we go to work, we need our coworkers to be like, dude, that uh, proposal you wrote up was amazing. I've never seen, like, that's the most proposed proposal I've ever seen in my life. Like, that's a good job. And then more so than your coworkers, who do you want to say that? Your boss. Like, I think we are in this stage where we thrive and we need this, like, hey, you're doing great, good job. Like, we, we need this sort of affirmation. We will do whatever it takes to, quote, be the greatest producers the world has ever known. And dad gummit, the world better know my name. I don't want them to say, oh, American laborers, they deserve a day off. I want people to say, dude, Stephen, you've been working so hard. How, I mean, how about you take a Sabbath? Go take a month and go in the mountains. Go hang out and fish. Like, I, like, I think we want to be recognized, and recognized by name. I don't want to be the best. I don't want the U.S. to be the best laborers the world has ever known. I want people to go, man, like, I don't want to call out names. Um, what's the name of a person I don't know? Uh, I don't know. Rich, John David Jingleheimer Schmidt is the best teacher on the planet. Like, they need to be writing the book on teaching. Like, like everybody should be like, hey, we're going to have a conference. Everybody at Pflugerville. No, Flug, thanks. Everybody, Flugerville, like all of Flugerville ISD is going to come up and John Jacob is going to tell us, John Jacob is going to tell us like, hey, this is how you can have a classroom as good as mine. We want that. We want affirmation. We want to be known. I think it's just naturally woven into our DNA um, because of the place we were born in and, and the society we were born around. Now, once again, I am not saying, I want you to hear this. I'm not saying that wanting to be recognized by your spouse for what you do is bad. I'm not saying that wanting your boss to recognize that you are the best person in the company is a bad thing. That's not what I'm saying. I hope that as us, Austin Life, whatever school, whatever workplace, whatever house you're in, people go, wow, these people are of the Lord. They are the best at what they do. I genuinely believe that. I hope there's recognition for what we do and where we do it. But it's the motive behind that, which is where we're getting. So if I remember this right, once again, none of us identified as bond servants. Did I miss a hand? 
I didn't see Michael in the hallway. Did you raise your hand then or no? Are you still husband is what you identify as? Okay, okay, so we're all there. If we will, I'm making my way down. Can we go to Romans together? We're going to go to Romans 6. Um, you know, Michael, I didn't actually see you until you thumbs down Pflugerville in the back, and that kind of broke my heart. <laughs> Whatever, man. I forgot where I was looking. I was all the way in Luke. I just was flipping because I was talking to, talking to Michael. I'm okay. It's okay if we enjoy our Christian friendships at church so much that we lose ourselves for a second, right? I think that's good. I think it's good to show we have friends. Romans 6. Um, we have over here um, Paul writing, and we get this. I want to read 15 through 23. They're not going to be on the screens. Um, I added this in. I, I kind of changed scripture. I, I feel like this best fits uh, what we're learning today. Um, so if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to maybe write this on your hand. There's pens around. Is it it's healthy to write with ink on your hands? Write it on the connect card. Save it for later and read this. Um, but it says this in Romans 6, 15 through 23. We have this same guy, Paul, writing. And he, is this where I want to be? No. Oh, no. This isn't where I want to be. Hold on. Hold on. Hold the phone. This is awful. Hey, y'all, this is, this is real life. I don't know where I'm trying to be. We're talking about... Let me get Google here. What? Is that it? It is? It was 15 a weird... It's the middle of the sentence. Should I start at 16? What? Oh, oh my gosh. Don't, I'm sorry. I went to Matthew because I looked at Matthew later on because I was talking, Michael, this is all your fault. <laughs> Let me flip over Romans. Y'all are there. Y'all know where you are. Um, now's a great time if you need to get some more water. Uh, feel free to do that. <laughs> are you laughing at me falling apart? Tommy, that wasn't, no, I'm just kidding. All right, so where I'm supposed to be in verse 15 because it makes sense. Um, yep, that's what I wanted to read. It says this, uh, what then are we to sin because uh, we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. For you know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. For I'm speaking in human terms, here it is, like I was saying earlier, because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented yourselves as members of your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. Now you present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and to its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This same guy who was addressing earlier and saying, hey, kids, obey your parents. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, submit to your wives. Bond masters, obey your earthly masters, says this here. It's the same dude. See, slaves of sin... Their master is they're working ultimately unto themselves, right? They're living with selfish ambition. How can I receive the most uh, joy in life? And I, and I know the end to that. But we see that slaves of God work unto their master as well. But as they're a slave of righteousness, their master is working unto the Lord. So like I said, I, I did not think going into this, if you're a churchy person, if you grew up here, you were going to hear a scripture you have never heard before. But this is where even as I was studying this, the Lord illuminated something to me. And if you knew this, awesome. Go tell people because it's some of the coolest news I've ever heard. Uh, and, and understanding my Christian life and understanding why people can be upset at Christians for the way they live. I think this helps me have so much more grace and understanding in that. So let me ask you this. Are you a slave to sin or to righteousness? 
We see here in Romans 6 that slaves to sin, what do they earn? Death, their wages. They are paid. Okay, you have worked, so your payment is death. You earned this. But slaves of righteousness, does it say what they have earned? You've looked. It doesn't say they earned life. Sorry, whoever said that. I set you up poorly. Sorry, Michael. Actually, you deserved it, Michael. <laughs> there, it, it says that the slaves to sin earn death. They are paid for their wages. Slaves to righteousness are given freely life. So I want you guys to hear this. As we go through this lesson today, and as it's Labor Day, and it's a topical sermon talking about working unto the Lord, Working into the Lord does absolutely nothing for your standard to God in regards to your salvation. He's not the master going, oh, well, they worked really hard. I'm going to set them free of their slavery early because of their hard work. No, whenever you work hard for the Lord, he isn't giving you salvation because of your effort. I want you to hear this. Salvation is free, but being like Jesus is not. The salvation you earn is given. It is literally, you wake up one morning, you say, Jesus, I repent for what I've done. I love you. You are my Lord. Night and day, immediate given gift. You are saved. Being like Jesus doesn't happen like that. That next day after, you don't come out of the water being baptized and your hair gets all long and flowing, your skin gets a little darker. Like you don't become like Jesus in an instant. And that's what Paul is saying here about slaves obey your masters. He's not saying, hey, you guys work unto the Lord because that's going to earn you like your master's going to like you more. God's going to like you more. He's going to have you. He's going to be on your good list. Paul isn't telling everybody here like, hey, you're either a slave to your sin or a slave to righteousness. So don't be a slave to sin. Be a slave to righteousness because then God's going to give you the house with a bigger yard with two football fields and you're going to have the shiniest gold in heaven for your house. God is not, Paul is not saying that. Holy Spirit is not speaking to that, that to us today. But it says here in Romans 6, 15, not Matthew, when in Romans 6, 15, it says, or in that section, in 22, right? Yes, you, but now you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God. So before the fruit of being a save, slave to sin, uh, of those things you were ashamed of is death. Now, in the second part of 22, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. Today, we're talking about Labor Day and reflecting on the fact that we are the hardest workers that the world has ever known and we deserve a day off because of how amazing we are. I think we're wrapped up, honestly, I know I am, of praises and cheers. Hey, work hard and then you earn something. Work hard and you get a raise. Hey, raises are good. Sometimes they help you pay your mortgage. They help you pay your rent. Let's be honest. Pay your mortgage. <laughs> They help you pay your rent. Like sometimes a raise is good. I'm not saying being noticed is bad, but why we do what we do is not because, well, I want what's better. But whenever we work unto the Lord, we earn or we are paid in being more like him. If you work for yourself and for selfishness, you're going to be paid in selfishness. You're going to become a more selfish person. You're going to become a more hard-hearted person. You're going to be a person who needs more and more and more and a bigger house and a bigger paycheck and more praise from your spouse and more praise from your roommates and your, uh, your, your lecturer, your, what are the professor asking you to give it, because, you to give the lecture because you're so smart, you're going to need more and more and more. But when we become a slave to righteousness and we say, Lord, I do everything for you, then we set ourselves aside. And the only natural response to that is we become to look more and more like Jesus. As we look to him, we look like him. So yeah, we turn our eyes upon Jesus. The things of earth, they grow dim. The, the rays, yeah, that's gonna be really helpful. That's not why I work hard in my job. I work hard in my job because the Lord is good and I wanna work for him because I wanna be like him. This isn't a work salvation sermon. Salvation is instant, it's a gift, it's free, it's handed to you. But looking like Jesus is not handed to you. That's something we work for. And that's what I talk about with grace. When we look, even Jesus himself, he went to the rich young ruler and he said, hey, all right, you want to follow me? Sell all your stuff and, and come follow me. He could have said, oh, you want to follow me? Great, and I'll take anybody. It's free, you just come and do it. No, he said, it costs you something to follow me. It costs you something to look like me. The rich young ruler was 
not willing to let that thing go. So today, as we look, Paul is not calling the bond servants to work for their master's approval, but for the Lord's because their good work will merit them some sort of salvation or being set free. I talked earlier, what is the difference between a bond servant and, and the children? One of the main differences? Inheritance. I'm sure age is probably also difference, but inheritance is another difference. In verse 24 of Colossians, we see the words that the inheritance is their reward. Those words, when all those people said, yeah, I'm a bond servant, and Paul looked at me and said, the inheritance is your reward. That would have lit up their, so I have an inheritance? Why do I work unto the Lord? Because he's giving me so much more than anything I could gain for my servitude. Like, yeah, I'm offered safety, I'm offered protection, but you're telling somebody is gonna give me an inheritance? The inheritance is the reward of looking, of, of working for the Lord. Jesus himself said in Matthew 6, this is why I was confused early, uh, 24, that no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or will be devoted to one and despise the other. So as we go, I say that because that's, I didn't tell him that's the cue for the band. As we go, y'all can come up. We're, we're gonna worship some more here in a bit. Um, but as we go, I wanna encourage you a few things. From what we can get to this in reflection to tomorrow, is anybody going to work tomorrow? Some people might. There's still a lot of places open. You're going to work. Yeah, Charlie's like, I'm going to work. I've got stuff to do. Some of us do. But if, if whether you're at work or you're at home and you're reflecting on the fact that we have earned this day off because we're so good at what we do, right? I want you to be able to reflect on the fact that in all that we do, you cannot serve two masters. So tomorrow when you're in your house and you're cleaning, maybe that's what you do on your day off, right? I hate, I hate doing cleaning on the day off. Maybe that's what you do. When you do that, you're doing it for the Lord. If you're doing it for any sort of selfish ambition, you cannot serve two masters because you'll begin to split your heart. So let's look at this. The, I told students, I did this for them. I hate going back to my roots. I, you can only take from today's sermon and from the word of the Lord whatever you're open to. But there's three things I took and three things I'm going to point out to y'all. And one is what I just said, that no one can serve can serve two masters. You're either a slave to your sin or you're a slave to righteousness. Sin earns you death. Righteousness gives you life. The second is that if then, if we have received an unmerited gift of life, our only feasible response is to work for the Lord. You didn't do anything to earn that free gift. You're not merited. You didn't put any effort in. The gift of life is handed to us our only natural response is to want to look more like the giver. And as we work for him, you look like him. This means in our homes, our jobs, our church, our studies, or your pickleball league, wherever you are, work unto the Lord. Our, our motivation shouldn't be, and I, I want to stick with this, our motivation shouldn't be, right, like when you're in your pickleball league, I want to be known as the most like agile and nimble person in a sport that was made for people who've lost their agility and lost their nimility, right? Like, we should be like, oh, I need everybody to know that I'm the best. It's like, y'all, it was a sport made for people to enjoy physical activity whenever their body's giving way on them. Like, chill out, it's pickleball. Like, have fun and have a good time, right? But when you're there or when you're at house, when you're doing whatever, your, your motive, it can't be. Man, if we're a follower of Christ, our motive cannot be, I want to be noticed, our motive has to be, I want to work for the Lord. Whenever I go to work, I want people to say, man, the Lord is good. I think Austin life should be filled with people who, yeah, we obviously struggle. We lose jobs. We get fired. That's fine. But I think people in your home should go, man, when I look at so-and-so, they are the best mother I've ever seen. Because whenever stuff hits the fan, they hold steady. Whenever so-and-so at work, man, I want to give them all the raises. Bosses should be like, man, these Austin life employees are great. Why? Not because you're trying to work to make your name known because you want to work for Christ and that compels you to work the best. And that is the third thing, that as we work for the Lord, we should give him our absolute best. Um, I have worked in a restaurant before. Anybody at restaurant people? I did not give the restaurant my best, y'all. And I didn't want to. I'm gonna be honest with you. It was like, by the time it was the end of the day and it was 12 hour shift and I've got a section to clean, I would sweep the crumbs under the like deck. You know, I, would, I did not work the best. The word doesn't, the Lord doesn't just want you to work for him and just, you know, scoot the dirt up under the rug. In response to the free gift, and because we want to be like Jesus, we work our best for him because we want to, as quickly as possible, be sanctified to look like Christ. That's what we see here.